Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we are going to tackle lung cancer. So let's dive in and get started. Let's start our lecture by discussing solitary pulmonary nodules, which are nodules that are defined as being well-defined lesions that are seen on imaging that are 30 millimeters or smaller and are always surrounded completely by pulmonary parenchyma. Now, when you get above a size of 30 millimeters, we call this a lung mass, not a lung nodule. And masses of this size are statistically more likely to be malignant. There are a number, a huge number, of causes for pulmonary nodules, from benign neoplasms to cancers to infections and more. But in terms of management, size is extremely important here. So if a nodule is less than or equal to 8 millimeters without any documented history of growth, you will monitor this with serial CT scans because the risk of the nodule being malignant is relatively low. However, if the lesion is above 30 millimeters, it's going to be resected because it is very highly likely to be malignant. Now, it's this 8 to 30 millimeter range where there's a wide variability regarding the likelihood of malignancy, and this is going to be based on several characteristics, and we'll discuss the potential causes of a solitary pulmonary nodule and these important characteristics that have an impact on the probability that a solitary pul uh, pulmonary nodule is in fact malignant, and we will discuss those. So here's a list of your potential causes of solitary pulmonary nodules. Keep in mind that this isn't exhaustive, but it is a look at some of the more likely causes. And that's really what we want to focus our attention on here is most likely causes. So first, we have primary lung cancers as potential causes. And we'll tackle uh, these in greater detail later on in this lecture. Then we have malignancies from other organ systems that have metastasized to the lungs. Granulomas can also appear as a solitary pulmonary nodule on imaging. And granulomas are associated with infectious causes like TB or other mycobacteria, histoplasmosis, and some other infections. Interstitial lung diseases can also initially present as a solitary pulmonary nodule in the case of sarcoidosis, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or a rheumatoid nodule. And finally, we've got some benign neoplasms like hamartomas or fibromas. Now, here are the risk factors that will increase the likelihood that a solitary pulmonary nodule is cancerous. In terms of age, there's a much larger likelihood of malignancy as someone gets older. So from the ages of 35 to 39, only 3% of solitary pulmonary nodules will be malignant. So very, very, I mean, 3% is pretty much your general population. Those though, between 50 and 59 years of age, that jumps to 43% likelihood that it would be malignant. Now for those 60 years of age and above, more than 50% will be malignant. Female patients, as well as those with a history of smoking or who currently smoke are at an even greater risk. If there's a family history of malignancy or a personal history of malignancy, this increases the risk that the nodule will be malignant as well. Additionally, a diagnosis of emphysema or exposure to asbestos increases the risk. Finally, the nodule itself can affect the risk. For example, larger no nodules that are located in the upper lobes or those that are part solid or spiculated are actually more likely to be malignant. So pay attention to how they describe it if they do. Now, the, sol the solitary pulmonary nodules will initially be seen on some sort of imaging. And if the patient has previous imaging done, we always want to obtain those images to see if the nodule was previously identified because growing nodules are more likely to be malignant and should be biopsied, whereas if a nodule has been stable in size for two years or so, it's more likely benign and then no further workups needed. And this is another question I've seen in the past um, on my own exams, where um, the first step is to look and see if previous imaging has been done. Now, usually there won't be prior imaging to refer to, right? That's just not it's just not one of those things that's common. So you're going to find this solitary pulmonary nodule on one imaging modality. At that point, your next best step for your workup is to get a chest CT without contrast and use a low radiation dose. The low radiation dose is preferred because you want to minimize the radiation exposure to the patient as obviously radiation itself is carcinogenic and that's kind of what we're exploring. Also, thin section uh, volumetric scanning CT can be used because it provides very accurate sizing and can be accurately reproduced in a future scan. The CT also gives accurate lobar location and allows for good visualization of density of the nodule and the appearance of the nodule's borders. If the patient's risk factors include increased age or smoking and risk factors associated with the nodule's appearance and size indicate that it is likely benign, what we're going to do at that point is serial CT scans. 
If it's likely malignant, then we'll biopsy or resect it. Once you've got your results back from the low-dose CT scan of the chest without contrast with thin section volumetric scanning, you can then make a determination on how to best proceed with either monitoring with serial CTs or biopsy. Now, this chart here is also in your books. Make sure you're familiar with this and review it so that you know how to proceed based on the size of the lesion. Now, when it comes to primary lung cancer, or really any cancer for that matter, uh, this simply means that the cancer originated in that specific tissue. Okay? Yearly screening in those with risk factors is very important. And remember, anybody with a smoking history or who is a current smoker and is over a certain age should receive regular screening. Now, here we have some symptoms that should make you immediately think of lung cancer in your differential. These include things like cough, weight loss, hemoptysis, even chest pain. Weight loss is, of course, a big one, but is constant for any type of cancer, not just lung cancer. But you always need to take weight loss seriously, and you should think cancer uh, when you see weight loss, okay? Amongst other things, but, you know, always think cancer when someone has weight loss when they didn't try to lose weight. Now, cigarette smoking causes almost 90% of lung cancers. So this is by far the most prevalent risk factor here, but also consider a history of other, uh, other risk factors like radiation therapy or exposure to certain carcinogenic environmental toxins like asbestos. Now, as far as smoking being the most prevalent risk factor, it's also the most preventable, right? You don't have to smoke. So we need to get patients to quit smoking if they're smoking as early as possible. Now, the most important distinction that you need to make when discussing lung cancers is identifying if the cancer is a non-small cell lung cancer, NSCLC, or a small cell lung cancer, SCLC. The adenocarcinoma is the most common form of lung cancer, making up around 50% of lung cancer diagnoses. This is going to be located in the periphery of the lungs. Next is squamous cell carcinoma of the lungs. Now, as opposed to the adenocarcinoma, this is typically located more centrally. Just remember, squamous is central. It may also be described as having central necrosis with cavitations. Remember that small cell lung cancer can secrete PTHRP. This means that hypercalcemia is possible alongside this type of cancer. So if they give you labs and they have lung cancer, they give you labs and calcium's high, you've got a pretty clear cut um, cause. Then we have the large cell carcinoma. This is located more peripherally, and this demonstrates prominent necrosis. Eosinophilia is often associated with this type of lung cancer, so you want to watch for that in the descriptor of your vignette or in the labs. Now, just as an FYI, I know I'm not covering these in detail, but in step one, this was covered in significant detail, right? So that's why we're not diving too, too deep. Um, but I still want to give you a little bit more details about some of the lung cancers. Let's take a look at a few more details about uh, small cell lung cancers. So these are located more centrally. They're also associated with SIADH since the lesion can secrete ADH. Too much of ADH, of course, means too much fluid will be retained. This can lead to hyponatremia. So you want to make sure that you remember from your step one, some of the common signs and symptoms of hyponatremia. You can also get a lesion that secretes ACTH. This, of course, can result in Cushing syndrome. Again, remember from your step one and make sure that you recognize what this looks like in a vignette. And finally, don't forget that Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome is associated with a small number of patients who have small cell lung cancer. And remember, this, of course, results in antibodies directed against the presynaptic calcium channels. Now, some more general perineoplastic syndromes that can't necessarily be strongly assigned to one uh, kind of lung cancer, but still in general uh, includes other neurologic disorders like cerebellar ataxia, sensory neuropathy, retinopathy, and other neurological symptoms, which are likely immune mediated. Now, hematologic conditions should also be considered, including anemia, uh, disorders of hypercoagulability, etc. Hypertrophic osteoarthropathy is another perineoplastic syndrome that you really want to keep an eye out for. And you can recognize this by identifying clubbing, arthropathy, and periosteal proliferation of the tubular bones. And finally, you can see dermatomyositis and polymyositis as a result of some types of lung cancer. Now, it's always important that you know where certain types of cancers are more likely or most likely to metastasize. Okay, so remember that when it comes to the lungs, it is known to spread most commonly to the bones, the brain, the liver, and the adrenals. 
All right, let's do some content review questions. Here is your first question. I will put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is D. Next question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer is A, adenocarcinoma. And your final question here, I'll give you 20 seconds. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back. The correct answer here is B. And that concludes this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.